I believe okay. so. No problem. Okay. Um, and then uh, staff, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, do the roll call. Mm -hmm. Member Larson. Member Blythdale. Larson's here. Sorry. Uh, Member Davis. Present. Member Gray. Member Miller. Here. Member Robledo. Your name up there, okay. Uh, Member Stubbs. Member Johnson the second. Here. And Member Murphy. Here. Okay, great. Excellent. And uh, we have first up to approve the minutes from the November 21st meeting. Everyone has a chance to review, has had a chance to review that. Uh, can I have a, any, uh, any changes or comments on those? Okay, can I have a motion to approve those? Move to approve minutes as written. Do I need a second for that? Yes. I, did I hear a second? Yeah, I seconded. Okay. Uh, the minutes from November 21st are approved. Uh, sorry, you have to, you've got to hold a, a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that's uh, uh, all those in favor of approving those? Aye. 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 Oh, okay. The, the uh, approval is carried. Um, and that starts with our scheduled uh, business next up uh, for so staff. Go ahead. So I am just going to turn it over to Kim Ladane, who's with the Parks Department, and she's going to be talking a bit about um, what they have planned for the next five years and uh, how that might fit with the CDBG program, and then also give you an update on the parks project that was funded in the last um, grant cycle. So the floor is yours, Kim. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if that's all right. Sounds good. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, chat with you all. Uh, it is lovely to see you in 2023. I was, um, I presented to this group um, about a year and a half ago, um, where we talked a lot about what our master plan looks like for our department, as well as some of our challenges, and talking about how we could potentially work together. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much for the support from the CDBG. Um, funds that you've made available to us are helping to improve our parks. And hopefully, I'll be able to um, give you more projects to think about and, and support as we move forward. So I'm going to talk quickly, as I know you have a pretty lengthy agenda. So just a brief overview, as I know there are some potentially new members. Um, the state of our system, uh, we, have, we are lucky, as we have five facilities, close to 900 acres, um, over 30 parks, uh, a dog park, three, uh, two pools. Um, 25 playgrounds. For a community our size, we're very fortunate to have the amount of infrastructure that we have. Um, unfortunately, it was all built during the heyday of parks and recreation. And as we all know, funds have gone a little bit sideways uh, for everybody in the last 20 years. And as a result, we have a pretty significant backlog. This $5 million backlog is like 2018 numbers. So we all know what inflation has done and what that looks like now. So, um, and generally it's about $250,000 of backlog ads every year. So we have a pretty significant amount of work that we need to do in our current parks um, to bring them back up to speed, to continue to make sure that we have a safe, accessible community um, resources. Additionally, we're resuming programs post COVID. I am so thankful for this. Um, it was a rough one for us. Well, obviously for everybody, um, but it's lovely to start seeing people start showing back up to programs and whatnot. Um, we had a recent round of budget cuts. Uh, we had shortage of operation funds. 
Um, and we have other competing funding needs. So when you take a look at our master plan, it is millions upon millions of dollars of projects um, and improvements that we hopefully, uh, that the community would like us to make. And our job, my job is to take a look at our priorities, take a look at our budgets and do the most good that we possibly can with the resources that we have. Um, so yeah, and, and on top of that, we have a growing, you all know this, uh, we're growing. And those folks who are coming into town want to make sure that they are living in a livable community um, with assets and amenities and to be able to go outside and walk around, have their kids play and um, go attend events and programs. So that is uh, our department in a very quick nutshell. So like I said, additionally, five facilities, almost 900 acres, 31 pike park sites, 25 playgrounds, 22 sports courts, 12 fields. Our last semester plan was passed in 2021. It identified a five and 10 year um, CIP that helps us inform future budgeting decisions. So the themes that came out of that master plan, there were four major ones, to sustain park assets that currently exist, enhance our current and existing parks and facilities, meet the needs for growth, and then collaborate, collaborate strategically with partners. Um, and uh, we need to sustain the existing level of service um, as much as we possibly can. So um, I want to say once again, thank you very much to this group, as I feel like we have collaborated really well with you all as partners um, with the CDBG grant. So in kind of taking a look at what we have on our radar for our department, um, looking at the low mod census map um, data, we've pretty much taken a look at the 204, 205, 208.1, and 208.2 areas to determine what our um, improvements that could potentially be made that we feel uh, that could benefit from CDBG dollars. Um, with that said, uh, ADA is a major, major component. Uh, the city is actually going through an ADA review process right now. Um, we actually have people coming out to our facilities next week. Uh, it's been a little bit delayed, but just like everybody else, our consulting firm is short on staff and they've been trying to do the best that they can with what they have. So um, from that, the transition plan, we're expecting to get a very lengthy list of improvements that need to be made as most of our, well, pretty much almost all of our facilities and parks went in before ADA was created. So uh, we know we're going to get a punch list. So in the next five years, um, I kind of tried to outline what um, projects could potentially overlap between us. So annually, we're going to be doing, um, once we get that transition plan from our, our ADA folks, um, we're going to be working on making improvements. Um, some of these could be, you know, a simple fix of five, ten thousand dollars. Others are not going to be simple fixes. They're going to be tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to get us into compliance. We won't 100 percent know until we get that list. Um, but it could be everything from replacing playgrounds, picnic tables, um, making sure that our sidewalks and our surfaces are smooth and, and um, make it a, a safe and usable environment for folks who use all sorts of mobility devices, um, making sure that we have signage and online access um, to make sure that when people are thinking about coming out to our facilities or our parks, if they do have um, some sort of accessibility need that they'd be able to go online and find out about that before they get in their car and come on out here and find themselves stuck. Um, with that, um, you all were wonderful. And in the last budget cycle, we were fortunate enough to be one of the grantors um, for a fitness court out at Burkhart Park, which lies in the 204 area. Um, and it's one of our parks that had, it, it needed some additional love. Um, we hadn't had an improvement there since, I think since 1993, um, and it, it needed some love. <laughs> so um, working with you all, we put together a grant for the National Fitness Campaign and we were able to install a uh, fitness court out there, which has 10 exercises. Um, it's supposed to be 10 exercises, 10 minutes, using mostly your body weight. Uh, it was an improvement that was scheduled. Some sort of fitness court improvement was scheduled on our master plan, and we were able to move that up on the timeline due to your support. Um, it was wonderful. We're very thankful for it. Unfortunately, due to our procurement timeline, uh, with how CDBG dollars roll in and their the money rolls out for them. Um, we ended up having to relocate some dollars from our department to offset that. And so in chatting with Beth and Anne, we um, have tried to think of another project that uh, lies within the current low mod areas that would meet the needs. 
And Lehigh Park is just that. It was a park that is um, was on our radar for the next year or two. Um, it is currently underserved. Uh, it is a very old playground. I'd say probably four plus decades old at least. Um, and because of that, not a lot of kiddos go there. Instead, they go to Lexington and Lexington is kind of bogged down um, by the amount of use that we get. Um, so we wanna keep the capacity, but get more use out there and focus on sensory features and, and make sure that it's accessible. And so we are, um, we are looking into doing a sensory playground out there, which would be wonderful. Um, and I think it would really complement our community. So uh, if everything looks good, then we are gonna go out and get some uh, feedback from our community members. You know, nothing without us, nothing about us without us to make sure that the families that would be using or could benefit from a sensory playground have the opportunity to say, here are the things that we would like to see. So um, if that's the case, the dollars that would go, that we're gonna go towards the fitness court will be relocated to, to Lehigh and will help to make another major improvement that was on our master plan of reality a little bit faster. Additionally, I'm sure you all know the waterfront project is coming to fruition. And um, for a person who is relatively new to the area, three years, I'd heard about the waterfront for many, for a long time. And I can't tell you how amazing it is to feel to get to be here when it actually happens. Um, so Monteith Park, as you all probably know, is going to be getting quite the facelift. New playground, new splash pad, um, new stage, and some generally just improvements for access and, and use in the park. Um, with that said, the restroom structure that is out there, if you've ever been to a River Rhythms, it's, you know, you come on down, it's on the right-hand side. It is, it is not a part of the current spec out plan due to funding. Um, it is not ADA accessible. Um, and it's just a little, it, it's gonna look a little stark compared to the rest of the park. So we've been trying to figure out how we can potentially say, save away some money and potentially working with CDBG. Um, if we can maybe do a, a restroom improvement after the project is over, as we're gonna have families who are hopefully gonna be coming down there wanting to change in and out of uh, swimsuits or clothing to get in and out of the splash pad. And we feel like um, that could be a really nice opportunity to make that part totally, in, uh, totally more inclusive, as well as kind of put the, the you know, the dot our T's, uh, <laughs> cross our T's and dot our I's when it comes to that last structure that unfortunately wasn't able to be priced into the original project. Um, and then otherwise, uh, 25, 20, 2025 and beyond, um, Hackleman Park and our skate parks could use significant improvement. Um, uh, you know, everything from redoing the courts that are out at Hackleman that are currently being used for pickleball. Um, our skate park has, has significant work that it needs to have done on it that um, to either patch or repave. There's gonna be opportunities along the Dave Clark Path, Lehigh Park and Bowman Park, both with sidewalks and paths. Um, I know it's not very um, sexy, but uh, parking lots need help too. And that helps to make sure that our spaces are attractive, promotes community pride as well, once again, as accessibility. So Eads, Kinder, Simpson, and Waverly all have um, parking lot uh, work that needs to be done. And then shelter and roof improvements for our shelters down there at Bowman and Monteith. Um, as you can see, the estimates vary. Uh, we're doing what we can with our pennies uh, within our department to be as um, conscientious and do the greatest good with the greatest amount of money that we have. Um, we're working to levy grants upon grants. So um, anything that we're able to work with you all on, I would, we would just be absolutely thrilled. So um, I know I kind of moved through that pretty quickly, but I just wanted to see if anybody has any questions. Comments, concerns, suggestions, I will happily take them all. Kim, can you remind me, uh, I think you've talked about before, but dotted Hackleman and the skate park in the pickleball courts, is that just need to be redone or is it gonna be made into something else? So um, at Hackleman, the, the pickleball courts used to be tennis courts. Our pickleball uh, folks came on in and helped to volunteer and raise some money for that. And so they were converted about 10 years ago. And in all honesty, they are at the end of their usable life at this point. So um, we are getting quotes for some of our other courts, one at Burkhart, one at Henderson, to see about getting them re resurfaced. Um, if it gets resurfaced to tennis slash pickleball, that's one thing. Some communities are making them into futsal, um, which is, is incredibly popular. We don't have a futsal area. Some are doing, you know, uh, turf 
uh, urban dog parks <laughs> or someplace where you can just let a dog go and run without having to worry about them going into traffic or um, bothering other folks. There could be an idea for a pump track out there. Um, there's quite a bit that was identified possibly in our master plan. It would be figuring out what the community is interested in and what our funding could look like. Um, and with the skate park, when we brought out somebody to take a look at it, it's about $600,000 just to fill the cracks and it's about a million dollars to redo it. So that is um, that's no small chunk of change. So we're doing what we can to, to make sure that it is safe and enjoyable for as long as it is, um, but it, it's only gonna continue to deteriorate as the years go on if we don't start putting some additional funds into it. Does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. So Director Ledane, did you send this out to us? No, I, um, I'm gonna follow up and send it to Beth afterwards. So um, I'm more than happy to send it your way. Thank you so much. No problem. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I do a question about the, what's the name of that lake out there? Oh, it's at its own. Oh. The pond, Waverly Pond, Waverly Lake. Yeah. What's any, what, what we have going on there, I know the people have complained to me a great deal about algae and, and that. Is there any way that we can increase the flow so water will flow through faster, to keep things so from being stagnant? I am thankful to say that when the last round of TLT um, requests went through, we included $20,000 for a bubbler out there. Um, and it was hopefully when the supplemental budget budget hopefully gets passed Wednesday, next later on this week, um, that'll be official. And so we are working with a contractor to come on out to, to work on that. So the hope is that we will be able to keep the algae at bay moving forward. That helps, thank you very much. No, I 100% I agree, uh, agree. It is not an attractive thing to look at. It doesn't make it easy for the paddle boats to go through. Um, so uh, we are we are very happy that we were included in that and that we were able to leverage those dollars to make not only a beautification effort, but also one that, um, you know, will just make it easier to recreate out there. All right. Anything I pre else? appreciate the support and thank you guys. We'll continue to work on in that capacity. And um, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to see you all again and have a wonderful 2023. Thank you. Great presentation. Thanks, Kim. Okay, so next I will um, turn it over to Dee Dee, um, who is with Oregon Cascades West Council of Governments, and she's gonna kind of provide an update on the um, small business grant program. Yeah, good morning, Beth and everyone else. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Ajo. And as Beth mentioned, I work at Oregon Cascades West Council of Governments in our one man band lending department. So this started so long ago um, with Beth and Ann Catlin and then, of course, Jenny Glass here at the COG, as well as Ann Whittington, trying to figure out how could we could utilize those um, those uh, funds to get out somehow to small businesses. And we we kind of struggled with some of the parameters as well. And what we came up with, or actually Jenny's brainchild, what Jenny came up with was we're attempting to do a small business childcare grant. So to um, businesses, small business, childcare businesses that have less than five people, they can't be a national chain. Um, and the, and the, the want out of this would be for them to create um, a low mod job, either for another person in order to increase the amount of child, child they can um, actually maintain in their facility or their home or the actual child care slots themselves. So we have um, actually gotten here. Today was the first day that we were sending out the marketing materials for that program. And so I don't know if you've received them. I can forward them to Beth and she can get them out to you if you had not already gotten them from Ann Whittington here at the COG. Okay. And so we created um, a lot of marketing materials, some flyers that Ann is circulating. And then our uh, communication specialist, Meg, will put out on some other social media sites. We also, first time for us, a um, great experience because I would like to incorporate this in my loan programs within the next year but we sent out all of our flyers in Spanish as well. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't ignoring or excluding people that just couldn't read the flyers and therefore would be um, 
unable or unwilling to even apply for the grant program. So I believe it was right around $33,000. We're breaking that up and offering it in um, six to $10,000 grants, depending on what they're looking for and what their needs are. And of course, hope to help as many people as we can. So again, I'll get those uh, flyers over so you can see what we created and what got started circulating today. So our timeline for this was to send out marketing materials starting today. And then January 9th through the 22nd, we'll be conducting advising sessions with interested applicants. So that's going to be Ann Whittington, or if they're Spanish speaking, Emma Chavez, who actually is um, in the CED department. She's an operations supervisor. And um, so that's also a requirement of the loan. The advising session is to help them understand what we're after and the materials we might need from them and give them advice on how to complete the application or associated documents. Uh, then January 22nd through the 28th, we're actually going to be accepting applications. So they'll kind of all flow in and we're just going to hang on to those. And then January 30th through the 3rd, the committee we put together that consists of Ann Whittington, Emma Chavez, Jason, just I'm sorry, Justin Peterson, and myself will be going through those applications um, and judging them against the criteria we created and choosing awardees. Um, and then we're hoping for a really quick turnaround on this February 13th through the 17th that we'll get the funding out to the actual awardees. And then the last item on that would be um, in June, approximately six months, we'll be going back and collecting the required reporting of what did they do with that money? Did they create another job? Was it a low mod job? Did they create more slots for children? So anyway, I just think we're all really excited about starting this, the whole Spanish speaking um, population that we're trying to draw in and expand to is just wonderful. Um, we're, we, we were talking this meeting, we met this morning and we were saying, what if we just get flooded with applications? That's going to be great because it shows it's there's a need. But then again, we're going to be sad because we don't have enough money to give to everybody. So anyway, hopefully this goes really smoothly and it ends up being a great program and a great example that we could hopefully get more funding for um, in following years, as well as just have it maybe be a, um, a starting point or a launch pad for other cities in our region to think about running a same program, similar program. So. Um, don't think I missed anything. Does anybody have any questions? I have I have a question. So is this the program? Are we we're thinking about helping or we already have funded with this with our CDBG money? Yeah, this is a program that was funded through previous years um, remaining economic development funds. So that were carried carried forward. OK, but we're not thinking of contributing any additional funds to this now we're just hearing how that money is being used yeah so i think right now we're hearing about how that money is being used but we can also consider like as we're creating this five-year plan is this something that we might want to think about including as a part of that plan so that we could fund it in future years as well um you know pending the success of the the program does that make sense yes but it's not taking away from the small business grants <clears throat> that this fund has given out before, or is it replacing the small business grants that this fund has done before? Um, so we, we have done small business grants before, and then I believe we had remaining money that um, the way we were trying to get that out to small businesses was not uh, efficient. We were having trouble matching, finding small businesses to fund through the city because that's not typically where small businesses go to access uh, grants or loans. So that's why we were trying to partner with um, the COG to because they are already in the business of providing grants and loans to small businesses and supporting them. And this is sort of the the program that they've felt like design wise right. would, okay. would I get work. It. Does that make so, sense? Yes. Yeah, sorry for my confusion. And I, I have That's to good. say full disclosure, I work with the COG all the time. I'm their partner for Business Oregon. I, I still want to say as a member of this commission, um, as a resident of Albany too, and as a member of this commission, I think it's it's great that these funds will be helping with the child care need. But I still think that those funds were very valuable to small businesses here in Albany and the ones that we have granted in the past. I was very pleased that we were able to give grants out to various small businesses here in Albany. And so if all of those funds get pushed towards small childcare providers, I, 
I probably would want to have a conversation about that to make sure that we still have some pot of money left over for um, for others. Because I think if you look at the awards we've made in the past, there was a, a good mix of minority owned businesses in there. Um, it really was very, it was varied. Um, and there's other ways for us to be promoting that fund through Small Business Development Center and others who do work directly with uh, small businesses in town. Um, yeah. I, I have a question for, for Didi. Um, and Didi, I worked with uh, Sandra a lot, so. Yeah, <laughs> so hi, <I'm> Melissa. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, it's a $6,000 award and they're, but they have to create another position, a full-time position with a $6,000 grant. No, 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 that's not, it's not the expectation. So the grants are anywhere from six to 10. Um, and they'll be obviously when they apply, letting us know what they want it to go toward, what we're hoping for. And, and they can use it for employee wages and or their own wages if they're the one man band running the childcare business. Um, so what we're hoping for though, is they may be able to take on another person it full time or part time, and therefore create the ability to have more childcare slots. Okay. okay. So, so one, or, I mean, we're we're happy with both. In some instances, they might have as many children as they could possibly handle now, unless they had additional help. Okay. So, if they got a ten thousand dollar grant, maybe they can pay to bring on a person, and then hopefully, with that person, they've got more children. They start to bring in more income, and then they could support that um, with the income of the business on a go forward. Okay, so they can use these grants for whatever they need to be able to provide additional services to the community. So if that happened to be upgrades to their fire system or something like that, right? Because a lot of them are facing a lot of issues with fire safety. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. That's that's good. Thank you. Yeah. It's any anything within the bounds of um, you know, that's eligible for CDBG. So nor the normal restrictions on what those funds can be used for. Do we have any other questions? All right. Thank you, Didi. You're welcome. So next up, I'm going to uh, have us continue our conversation about setting goals. We had set our priorities um, in a previous meeting, but didn't kind of finalize those goals that will correspond with the priorities. So I will share my screen in a moment. Okay. Can you all see what I've got up? Great. Yes. Yeah. So again, this is sort of the structure that the um, consolidated five-year plan follows where you have kind of your overarching priority, there's associated goal or goals to that priority, and then there's projects and activities that kind of relate to that. Um, here are the priorities that we agreed on in a previous meeting. So supporting affordable housing, reducing homelessness, increasing um, availability of needed services, expanding economic opportunities and strengthening and revitalizing low and moderate income neighborhoods. Um, and these were the last, the goals from the last consolidated plan. We don't have to stick to these, but we can um, as they ap apply to our priorities. But I just wanted to kind of give you that context again. And here's how they looked in relationship to the priorities that we had in the last plan. Um, so you'll see some of them have more than one goal per priority. Some priorities just have that one associated goal. So there's some flexibility. Some goals might cross over between multiple priorities. It's, uh, from my perspective, it's a little bit more simple to keep things um, goal, a goal specific to a single priority, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so here, I wanted to just kind of walk us through each of the priorities so we could determine what the goals should be. And so in thinking about that, so the first priority I had was support affordable housing in Albany. The question is, what should the specific goal be? The project usually mimics that goal. And then thinking through the activities. So what activities would be eligible um, with our CDBG funds that could advance the goal? 
so that we know that the goal is something we can actually do with the funds, if that makes sense. So any thoughts on what the goal or goals should be for support affordable housing in Albany? So Beth, question, um, mm -hmm. shouldn't we wait to do this until we have the new commission set up? We really just need to move forward with this, with our current um, commission. I mean, the current commission is just, is until the new members are ratified. And um, it happens that we need to move forward with this so that we can keep on track with our consolidated plan process. Does that make it's sense? It's only two days. But we won't have another meeting until January 30th where we'll be going um, over the applications. So I'm just, con I'm concerned about the amount of time we'll have available at a future meeting to go over this content. So with the new commission, we'll have an opportunity to revisit this, right? Um, it's possible. There'll be time, like we'll, we'll still be taking, you know, um, the plan will not be set in stone until it's like adopted and goes to HUD for their approval, but we want to kind of keep things on track um, going forward. Forward. Well, I understand that, but I, I would hate to, I'm, I'm not comfortable personally of applying, of approving, putting something together now that the new commission hasn't had a chance to participate in. The I, outgoing group is the outgoing group. I second the mayor's um, feelings on that. I'm not going to be on the, the next group, and I, and I don't know that I feel right setting goals and stuff like that that I'm not going to have any say on in making sure, sure. Um, how would you guys feel about kind of setting draft goals then and that the next commission could then kind of confirm that those goals are in line with what they are thinking or if they uh, have other ideas that could be discussed i can support that okay. i just don't want them set in stone okay sure. that seems that's fair so They'll kind of be our tentative goals until the, until the, the next commission um, confirms that those are in line with what they believe to be right. But I, I also I also will say that you guys have been um, able to get all of the data and the agency consultations and the information. So I do feel like this current commission has some good background um, and to provide informed input on this. And hopefully that can kind of be the baton that is handed off to the next commission that they can run with too. Well, I like the, like the idea of the draft goals and okay. then have the other opportunity for them to take a look at them as well. Okay, great. Sounds good. So specific to this uh, affordable housing um, uh, priority, um, the goal uh, should be measurable, uh, you know, attainable. Uh, measurable, uh, the four categories of affordable housing, I think there were four, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the, 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 the simple thing should be to increase capacity in each of those four categories. Um, the question is uh, the measurement um, for it. How, how much is it, how much is realistic? Yeah, and that's the, specific quantity is something we can return to as we like look at what are the specific projects and activities that we see in the next five years that kind of will happen together I think but I do think you're right that our goals should be it have it in mind that they could be quantifiable mm -hmm. yeah because I know personally when I voted for you know I was looking at number of units uh, you know is a is a overriding um Go, I mean, over a very, very important part of the approval process. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is like one of the goals should just be increasing the number of affordable housing houses in or housing in each, units in Albany. In each category, yeah. In each category. And by what by category is there? Could you? Yeah, um, um, my my memory. Excuse me, it's from memory right now, uh, not from notes. But it was the the um, shelter, uh, kind of the the shelter level the um, transitionary level, go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, uh, shelter, transition. Um, the two other ones were uh, affordable, uh, into affordable uh, rent situations 
and then into affordable ownership situations. Okay, so like along that spectrum of along housing. That spectrum, yeah. And I think okay. I think that you know that would be you could go a big way with saying the community's success, the commission that is doing its job, if those overall units increase relevant to some standard that exists mm -hmm. nationally mm -hmm. or regionally. So the only uh, clarification I guess I would ask for is, do you think that the shelter increasing like shelter capacity might be a better fit under reduced homelessness? Or do you think that's something that could still should still be a part of this goal? I think personally, I think, and I'd open to other comments, I think it's it's an important part of this goal as well. Okay. They could fit in both places. I mean. Yep, that's true. So my, I would add the caveat to that because we have what high barrier shelters. Um, do we have any low barrier shelters? Um, I believe low barrier shelters are kind of in the works right now. I know because I know that Helping Hands was planning something. Mm -hmm. um, everybody else has barriers. My yeah, concern, I okay. think Second Chance is also planning for low barrier shelter, but I, I could confirm that with them. Sorry to interrupt. Oh no, I, I'm I'm listening. I agree. I think you, you the whole system breaks if you don't have low barrier. Um, I mean, obviously the system's broken today, but I mean, you know, to some extent. But uh, you know, if you don't have those those covered as well. Okay. So I'll mention from the in our past plan in a major program that we funded over the last five years has been the um, low income housing rehab program, um, which preserves affordable housing. Is there an interest in having a goal that might speak to like the preservation aspect of affordable housing? I, I think that's inherent in, in what we're doing here. I think that's a great, we should probably, yeah, we probably should call it out. Yeah, just because to me, there's a little bit of a distinction between adding housing and keeping housing. Mm -hmm. Preservation, yeah, I agree with you. Well, and housing rehab with CDBG is, is not, it, it's not necessarily preservation. It's creating and keeping healthy spaces for low-income owners. So it would be, you know, making sure that there's no mildew or that the windows don't leak or that the roofs don't leak, those types of things. So it does play into, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm thinking preservation when it comes to like, historic present because that's how it always comes right. up oh, yeah. for right. me right. <laughs> but like yeah um i just think we have to be careful of that preservation word since we do have historic units yeah in albany maintaining so kind of, keeping yeah. units from going Main, maintaining down. yeah yeah okay yeah i can we can have some wiggle room with the language and kind of avoid the preservation element but the idea that we want to keep existing affordable housing in quality conditions so people can continue to live there. Yeah, housing rehab is one of the most successful CDG programs in the state, in any state. So I think it's it's a number one priority, I think, for for me being part of this group. And then I, I defer to Robin and others who are, I'm not a housing expert, but I think what how you describe that, Robin, that continuum of how to bring people through makes a lot of sense. So, so then, my question to, to the group is the tiny home, the tiny home village, where did that roll into is that transitional or is that? Um, I think that's long-term ownership because there is an ownership position in there, isn't there? Yes, and Stacy has been very clear every time I've mistakenly said transitional that it is not transitional housing because there's a stigma yeah. that goes along with that I idea, I think. But ultimately, if we took the idea of transitional out of you know homeless transition and people stigma along with that, then yes, it is a transition of people being going from renting, low income rent to being able to own a home or maybe it is someone who is transitioning from a shelter situation through a rental situation to being able to own a home. Yeah, so I would say those are the sorts of projects then that we could see in the activities category would apply back to the goal. Things like the tiny home village um, or supporting shelters with expanding their capacity 
um, low barrier or otherwise, you know, or transitional. Um, and then the housing rehab program also fits nicely in there. I think in the past there have been some challenges to doing a home ownership program because um, the housing market makes it difficult for CDBG, CDBG dollars to have enough of a dent into a down payment um, to be to make a big difference. But it's something that it sounds like is a priority for this group to to try that again in the future to open up home own, low income home ownership opportunities. I think we would have, sorry, Robin, I see you're saying, I think we'd have to look to someone like Dev Northwest or the COG to help manage something like that for us, because mm -hmm. I also look at, you know, rental assistance programs with CDBG money um, for low income individuals. And then that, yeah, down payment um, for home ownership, but that's not something I think that this group or the city has the capacity to manage programs like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that could be something where we work with Dev Northwest on if they're building new, you know, um, affordable home ownership opportunities through like a community land trust or something, maybe there's an opportunity there. Yeah, those uh, land trusts are an exciting, I think, an exciting possibility for the future of housing, affordable housing. Are there any other thoughts or comments on um, kind of the two goals of expanding uh, affordable housing along the housing continuum and then also uh, maintaining affordable existing affordable housing so my question and maybe I'm struggling with the terminology but are these goals or objectives because goals are those overarching activities initiatives that you help identify your priority and what I'm hearing is objectives of yeah and so I'm, I'm, I'm confused with the terminology because as a public, you know, public health professional, I look at goals as that overarching and then the priority and then your objectives. So, yeah, I think the HUD does the language maybe a little bit reversed, but it, I think that what you're thinking of as objectives, I think that is probably pretty in line with what we're talking about here as a goal. It's just how they word it, I guess. So it's, it's really just like what the prior, priority is really the umbrella here. And then the goal speaks to that, which is normally it would be a goal. And then the objective speaks to the goal, right? So does that help or did I muddy the water any further? The goal would just question is going, going to kind of advance. How are we going to advance that priority in in kind of broad terms? And then the project and activities is where it kind of narrows down to like what specific thing will get funded. Commissioner Miller, does that address your concern, or would you like to see actual dif different language than what HUD uses? No, that's what HUD uses, but it's definitely not what public. That's not a public health model, and it's not public health terminology on how this is identified. Does you have your goals, your priority, then your objectives and your projects and activities that reflect that. So I, I understand HUD is a different <laughs> yeah. And when you're working with the feds, not everybody talks to each other about being universal in their language, but that is definitely, I'm struggling. That's why I'm struggling with, these are not goals, these are objectives. And I mm -hmm. got my brain around it. Okay, yeah. Sometimes the language that gets handed down to us is not, the most helpful. <laughs> well, it sounds like there's general consensus as far as those two kind of draft goals or draft objectives um, for how that might relate to supporting affordable housing. So I'm going to move on, move us on to the next one. So our next one is reduce homelessness. And so what do we think um, would uh, advance that? How can we address that priority. So is this where we talk about how we've already funded and can we've continued to fund in the past and we still get applications all the time from the shelters and um, different service providers. Is this kind of where this falls that those? 
Yeah, so the types of things that we've uh, done in the past that might relate to this goal in the future would be, you know, the shelter staff that do like case management, um, any shelter improvements. Um, you could say like outreach and um, like resource navigation to people that are uh, homeless currently or without shelter currently could fall into that category. So those are some of the activities that could relate. Um, increasing shelter capacity, again, that's something that might work here. Um, where do we get uh, a yeah. sense? Excuse me. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, where to ask where, where do we get a census of our unhoused uh, community from? Is it from a variety of organizations? Do we combine it or is there one number that is official? So there's a yearly um, point in time count that uh, I believe community consortium community services consortium heads up and yeah. um, it's a national thing but that's who does it here in Albany and they do uh, a count of everyone that is homeless on that day uh, in Albany but they also do the, the rest of our region too. Thank Which you. is going on right now and I'll just throw it out there that um, I, I haven't been able to help the last couple of years but they are always looking for volunteers to help go do those point in time interviews with homeless individuals. And I sent out an email this morning, I believe, with that information. I can Let forward that along to the to the commission. So anyone that's interested in getting involved with that is welcome to. So again, I think the goal here has to be a numeric reduction in the amount of of that census. It's hard because um, it gives us a, an idea, right, of that moment in time, that day. Um, there's more to it than that, obviously, but I think the, I mean, I think the better count is from our service providers who tell us how many people are in, how full are they all the time and how, you know, uh, so I guess for this one, I guess, as long as we're able to continue to help with shelter improvements, adding more beds, whatever needs, what the actual direct needs are, like, you know, is it specific? Is it specific to, you know, mothers and children? Is it, do we need that kind of stuff? So I just want to be able to be flexible and making sure we're, we're meeting the needs because from what I've heard over the last few years, it's never that, it's always that they are, they're at capacity always, no matter what they're offering, it's always at capacity. So, so numbers, capacity, throughput sort of goal. <clears throat> So systems that's at capacity doesn't really, isn't really functioning optimally. So then the idea should have to be to have a constant excess capacity to address the problem. Excess being a term, maybe not the right term, but. Yeah, I and mean, I'm not really sure. I'm not, I don't know enough about the homeless population in Albany to know where that point in the process like is it where are the where we needed the most right like it is is it when people are getting out of prison is it when people are you know like is it seniors who are losing their home like i don't know where that sort of maybe it's preemptive things i don't know where we could be preemptive to be helping with not adding to the population of homeless individuals so do we look at the uh, responses from the surveys who, where somebody tells us why they're homeless and do we then count those up and quantify them? And Yeah, I think, I think one of the struggles too with CDBG is um, it's hard to use our funds. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on using our funds to like for rental assistance um, mm -hmm. to prevent homelessness. So we rely on other agencies that have funding to do that, to play that role. Um, and uh, honestly here, the goal can be as simple as kind of mimicking the priority, which is we wanna reduce homelessness. And maybe we add a little bit more like through supporting our shelters and um, like their services and also their facilities. Mm -hmm. What about something specific about, and I know that we've been able to do this with the state funds, is support um, drug rehabilitation. rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we've ever done that with the city dollars, but that is something specific that we know is attached to homelessness. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we've ever 
gone that route with support. I don't even know how we would do it here in Albany and where we would be able to support, but maybe there's a way that we can be doing more to help those services. You beat me I to the punch on that. I was actually thinking with uh, the homelessness and the drug rehab, even if it's more focused towards homelessness, but if we can have more drug rehabilitation um, citywide, because I, uh, there are people that become homeless because they develop a drug problem. Yes. And so if we can, yeah, if we've never, especially if we've never done that before, I think that might be a real positive influence for the city. Absolutely. And what I would add to this goal is the tenuously housed. So the people that are, are, are at risk of, of being on the streets because they don't have credit or they don't, they don't have a, a, um, a criminal record or in there, and they're currently like, you know, jumping around to various residences of family and friends and that sort of thing. That'd be a much larger number than I think any of us would imagine. Um, so if we could identify that or, or at least address that as a known, known issue, that would be great. Cause I'd love to see some sort of program for people that just have no credit to be able to get into a rental. I know we have some of those things now, but more of that sort of capacity to be able to get into a rental. Yeah, I think let's, the, I agree. That's definitely, I think, a need. Um, I think where we hit the kind of the rub is who can do that and can we fund them through CDBG? Um, can they expand those services? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I haven't really seen um, someone come to us and say, you know, we, we have this service and CDBG could help. Um, and so it's, I think, a delicate balance of being aspirational in what we want to do and also making sure that we're creating a plan that we can really implement. Does right. that make sense? Mm -hmm does so i'm hearing that maybe a goal specific to expanding um drug and alcohol and mental health services to people might fall might be a good goal for under this category yeah i really like that idea okay. yeah i mean there, it, there's some things we still have to make sure those individuals fall into the presumed population so it would be a little bit tricky but to your point beth i think one thing we could be doing as a commission is talking to the providers more and, and not necessarily the ones that are here in Albany, there's others in the state that maybe there's somebody else that could help run some of these things that we're talking about. Um, it just hasn't started in Albany yet. Yeah, that's a good point. Have we, and then, oh, sorry, go ahead. Have we conducted any surveys about um, like what kind of businesses or places in Albany that you know, have jobs available and that kind of stuff, how many of them will hire um, people who have records and that kind of stuff or charges? Is there, because I, when I think about what you guys were talking about in terms of uh, people who have been released from prison and the, you know, there's a lot of them that have that, they're couch surfing until they don't have anywhere to go anymore and that kind of stuff. But do, do we know how many businesses in Albany will hire um, or what they are? Do we have those resources for people who are getting out of prison or getting out of rehabilitation centers or, or those types of things? I don't have an official survey on that or data on that. It might be something that people who are helping folks that are transitioning out of incarceration might have some anecdotal um, knowledge of what, it, uh, what organizations or what businesses hire people with um, a criminal background, but I don't have the information off. Like well, one thing we available. could do, we could always ask our work source partners to come and talk mm -hmm. to us about that because there are um, there are programs at the state level and at the local levels through uh, the workforce boards and WorkSource Oregon that are supposed to be helping with those transition of post prison, post jail um, transitions. But I think Kristen, your point was exactly what I was getting at is that that if we could kind of help with whatever programs are out there already for those say individuals who are in aftercare. So in, in drug and rehab, they call it aftercare, right? They have to go into a, ho a specific kind of home or they, they go to an aftercare program. Um, but the same that I would assume sometimes happens for individuals who are released from the, the 
prisons and jails or or not maybe they just get i don't know right like they just mm -hmm. let a lot of times i hear they just they just walk out and then they're they're on their own so uh, but there's definitely people and programs who are there whether it's through the uh probation whether it's others that maybe we could be tapping into and saying where can we be most helpful mm -hmm. yeah and i believe second chance well, is expanding their um program to help people who are transitioning uh out of out of jail or prison too so they could be a resource potentially um i i i work at the department of corrections and we're kind of work along with the uh, oregon correctional enterprises so i i can reach out to them and see if they have anything that they can point us to. That'd be great. That's great. Okay. Isn't it all stars employment? It's all star employment here in Albany that prov provide uh, jobs for people who are transitioning out of uh, prison and jail. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, is that the is that connected to WorkSource, Joanne? Do you know? I don't know if it, I'm not sure if it is, but it is all stars. Right. It's a private. It's a privately held company. Um, I do have one one thing I'd like to add. Uh, one thing that we we as a city have done have not done a lot with is an expungement clinic, because there's some people that can't get rental rent, rent rentals because they have something in their past. So I, I think we could look at um, more information around that. Uh, I think last I heard was like 10 to 15 grand to get your rec record expunged for something that happened when you were when you were in your teens. Right. So that's something we should take a look at as well. Yeah, again, I think that sounds um, like a great idea, a great program. I'm not sure that that's something that CDBG funds could help with, given the kind of limitations on how those funds are used. Um, I can look into it, uh, but I would be skeptical because um, I have not seen anything like that as far as the service that CDBG can provide or fund. Um, so the kind of just so refocusing us back on this reducing homelessness um it sounded like before we were also maybe considering how we might support shelters with their facilities um and turning in including things like maybe expanding capacity uh, specifically for low barrier or um doing repairs or improvements that's something we funded in the past and it, it's in general can be a good use of cdbg funds because it doesn't fall under that public services cap so it opens up some funds that um shelters can make use of outside of just uh the services component so are there thoughts on that um as a goal i think that's a good goal okay and i am looking at the time and i and I'm also hearing that it's okay that we continue this conversation with our uh, next commission. So I'm going to kind of take those goals, put those as drafts, and we'll revisit the remaining priorities at the next meeting. Um, and one thing that I do wanna make sure we have time for is a discussion about um, the meeting schedule, uh, which I guess also might be something that's valuable to consider with whoever the next set of commissioners are. But if does anyone have any um, thoughts or opinions on the current meeting time, particularly those of you that maybe are, are staying on the commission? Because I know that it's been difficult for people to make this um, Monday at noon time slot work. Uh, Monday at noon is 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 uh, diff difficult compared to other days. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, for me personally, the later part of the month is better than earlier part of the month, but you know, other than that, uh, that's all I can say. Is there yeah. an interest in, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I was concerned more or less with not just the Mondays, but the noon hour, mm -hmm. which eliminates the public from being involved. We don't have public comment because we don't meet at a time where it's conducive for the public to be available. Um, and it's, it's sometimes it compromises, especially for me. I mean, I get called into a meeting by my bosses and say, hey, I need you here, and I have to miss this meeting, which has happened the last couple of times. But it's also, I'm, I'm more concerned that the public really don't have an opportunity to participate if these public meetings, we're holding them at a time where the average public person can't attend, even though who are working and can, uh, you know, want to be here, can't be at these meetings because they're at noon. And, you know, I, I would I would request that we start meeting having the meetings in the evening 
um, or you know, early evening like we do with the planning commission and the city council meetings where it does give people opportunity to get off work, go home or go zip, zoom in or so that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Is there um, interest? Would it work for people to consider doing a early evening meeting? I can, uh, if there, if that is something that could potentially work, I can send out some like doodle polls to figure out what, what evening might work best and time and stuff. Does that sound good? I to think the that a doodle poll is a great. I think a doodle poll is a great idea. But as long as it's not Monday evening, we're okay. Okay, or not Wednesday. Mondays. Right. <laughs> not Mondays or Wednesdays. Anybody got Tuesday, I Thursday? City, I, have, I have city city council meeting on the work session starts at four. City yeah. council city starts at six. six. Yep, yeah. so that's yeah. not gonna work. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. And I'm sorry, all I have to excuse myself. I have a meeting. Okay. Thank you, um, John, for coming. Thank you. I would just Thanks, I'm, fine with, I'm fine with I'm fine with whatever just... we decide um I would just rather have them earlier in the evening than later like I don't want seven o'clock start meetings are terrible so yeah okay um, we do it at 5 30 that's great sounds good okay um well, we will continue those other agenda items in the future. Okay. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Commissioner okay. Davis, to just run us through the remainder. All right. Um, do we have any business from the public? No business from the public. OK. Uh, any business from the commission? I have nothing. Oh, yes, I do have one thing. Um, I've asked several people to help me with this. Uh, social services people cannot meet at this time. That's why I'm happy about the discussion. If I, I'm, I'm in need of a social services person, but I think that will be removed as soon as we change the meeting time to a later time in the day. So I'll still be looking. I've asked several people to help me with that. Um, but if you know anyone in social services, uh, I'd greatly appreciate their phone number. Have them give me a call. Great. That's the only spot that's left. Okay, so when we are slated for um, January 30th, uh, so that's currently slated for a June, uh, it's June, a January 30th meeting at noon, correct? Yeah, and I don't think we can change that meeting because we have included that in our application process. So our applicants will be expecting to um, come and present on their uh, proposals. So, but for future future meetings then we can consider um moving the day and time and you'll send out those polls uh this week uh yeah i yeah i probably late this week um and that way hopefully i can include any like new commissioners in that awesome those polls will be for what then uh scheduling oh that's okay I it was yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for the for the presentation on the thirtieth, will there be material beforehand? Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah I'll send out the the packet of all of the applications that are received in advance of that meeting. And it, will we be just hearing from the agencies at that meeting, or looking at our actual scoring? I anticipate that it'll be primarily hearing from the agencies, but I think the more that people have looked at the um, applications and you know started the scoring process, um, the better it'll easier it'll be to ask the questions mm -hmm. that we have and all of mm -hmm. that as as you know because you've been through this process a number right. of times. Right. So. Yeah, and I want to I just want to reiterate that we really need to take in consideration the application scoring process. Um, I don't want to spend time reviewing an application scoring it because it didn't have all the information that was required to be a part of the application and spend time reviewing it just because we funded them in the past. Or there's, if we're gonna use the application as the foundation to make decisions, we really need to be intentional as commissioners. And if that's not the case, I don't wanna waste my time again. I spent a lot of time reviewing those applications 
and then find out every, oh, they've been doing this for so long, but they didn't have half that information mm -hmm. that they were required to have in an application and we considered them for funding. Yeah. So I, I wanna really be clear because my time, I, I have a, don't have a whole lot of time to give to everything that I do in the community. And if we're not gonna use that application process as the foundation for really funding it, let's not do it. Let's just presentations. I mean, I'm, I just don't wanna waste my time again. And that's- I agree with Commissioner, Commissioner Miller. I, I agree too. She's, she's definitely, she's brought this up through different uh, <laughs> sessions and it's, it's, you're right. It's, it's time we do something about it. Can you, so can you, when I send uh, out the application the packets, I can send out our scoring matrix as well. So that that's makes it really easy to, you know, review and just keep in mind like, okay, this is what's on the application and here's the results. It's not and about how I feel you, about it. It's just about the scoring. Incomplete that, application that, should be rejected. I'm sorry. I was, I was going to go there. So yeah. can you put something in your email out to the agencies that incomplete, incomplete applications will not be considered? And just be done with it. Yeah, I can let them know. I will say that there are, I think, some new agencies applying this year. Um, and I do intend to look at those applications, all of the applications in advance to make sure that they've uh, met the requirements. But hopefully we can ex extend a little bit of grace to people that are new to this process. Not that they should be missing whole components of their application, but if there are questions that we can get those answered from them. But absolutely, we uh, are, I'm hoping to receive quality applications. They've all gone through the application, uh, pre-application workshop, so they should have all the information they need. And um, many of them have already reached out with questions. So I think that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so next meeting on January 30th at noon. Uh, does anyone have any other further comments or questions? Well, thank you for taking my comments. Of course. Appreciate great. the input. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this uh, one is adjourned. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's shorter than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was planning for two hours, and then I looked just before coming here, and I thought it was only an hour.